Well, thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure uh, to be here at this INET uh, Tsinghua uh, University conference. INET is the Institute for New Economic Thinking. It's trying to think about uh, new ways of thinking about the uh, economy, new, more realistic ways. And I think it would be useful to start by just saying, well, how does the predominant form of economics, uh, neoclassical economics, what does it say about the role of finance and the role of investment decision-making? Well, I think it's not unfair to say that the way it thinks about investors and entrepreneurs making a decision about whether to invest in one project or another uh, is summed up by this slide. It envisages a very rational process in which somebody in a rational thinking uh, fashion mathematically works out the net present value of a series of cash flows over time, establishing to each year of those cash flows a definitive uh, probability. That wasn't meant to happen. Can we just come back? Uh, a definitive probability and discounting it by an appropriate risk-adjusted a rate uh, of uh, return. That's what it broadly says in neoclassical economics is the decision-making process of the investor. As for what it says about what banks do, in most modern uh, economic textbooks, insofar as they address the banking system at all, and to a surprising extent, the banking system is often absent from economic textbooks, but insofar as it's there at all, the description will broadly say what banks do is take deposits from savers. These are usually thought of as household savers. They say they take a, 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 a deposits from savers and they put them into uh, investment projects. And what they then say is there is a process going on where there are a whole series of investment projects available to the economy which we could rank by reducing rate of potential return and the process of allocation of capital through the banking system makes sure that we select the higher return projects, not the lower return projects. Um, now, the key point I want to make is that that description of the... Uh, uh, what the financial system does, both in relation to the investor and in relation to what banks do, bears, I think, very little relationship to the fundamental processes of investment uh, decision-making. If we were to look, for instance, at the financial processes that lay behind on this chart, the extraordinary expansion of the density of the UK railway system in the 1850s, uh, we will find that this was not a rational process at all. It involved a mania. It left us with a railway system of immense uh, economic uh, value, but a lot of individual investors lost a lot of money. So, the description is not the way the world is. But what I want to focus on is the role of banks. And I want to start by saying that the description of banks as taking money from savers and lending it to investment projects is wholly inadequate. And a person who realized it was wholly inadequate uh, was actually a Swedish economist called Knut uh, Vixell, uh, who wrote uh, in the 1890s and 1900s. And he was a key economist who realized that banks don't just take pre-existing money and invest it, they create purchasing power. Because what a bank does when it makes a loan to an entrepreneur or to a state-owned enterprise is at the moment where it makes that loan, it both credits and debits, both the loan to the entrepreneur and the money in the entrepreneur's or the business or the state-owned enterprise's account. It creates purchasing power. And Vixell, in a, a, a very fine book, and one of the ironies, I think, of the Institute for New Economic Thinking is that many of us has realized that in order to do new economic thinking, we have to go back to the, some of the great textbooks of the past. Uh, in a great insight, Vixell said, well, what controls this process of uh, credit creation, purchasing power creation? Why doesn't this just run out of control? And he developed the thesis 
which I think was insightful but not sufficient, that there would be a problem if the interest rate uh, at which uh, loans were available was below the marginal productivity of capital. He suggested that there was some equilibrium situation which would be just uh, a calm and would involve the appropriate amount of credit as long as the interest rate was appropriately set. Now, as I say, I think, and one of the things I'm going to say at the end is I think that is an insufficient definition of what we require for stability. Indeed, I think that in the pre-crisis period in the advanced economies, our belief that we could control the credit creation process simply through the appropriate setting of a policy interest rate was a major intellectual uh, mistake. But nevertheless, Vixel's insight into purchasing power was fundamental. If banks create purchasing power, it is crucial to ask to whom do they give that purchasing power. And if they give purchasing power primarily to businesses, to entrepreneurs, to state-owned enterprises, then they can achieve a skew of the economy, a bias of the economy, towards investment, not consumption. They can essentially uh, produce uh, what Hayek thought of, Friedrich Hayek, another uh, a great earlier economist, as forced savings. And Hayek described forced savings as being an increase in capital creation at the cost of consumption through the granting of additional credit without voluntary action on the part of the individuals who will forego consumption and without them deriving any immediate benefit. And I think that is fundamental, that the process of credit allocation can drive up the savings and investment rate of an economy without that being the conscious choice of householders in that economy. Now, that credit allocation process then has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it can, for a period of time, drive more rapid economic growth. And I think if we look at the economic growth paths of both Japan and Korea, it is a fact that in an early period of that growth, what is called financial repression, i.e. not giving uh, households very high rates of interest and lending large amounts of money to industrial development, was a part of the development a process. And that is an important contradiction of the pre-crisis orthodoxy, which always taught that you must liberalize uh, financial markets and you mustn't have this thing called financial repression. So financial repression and a skew of the credit allocation process towards investment can be a useful part of the growth process. But it is a useful part which brings with it problems and which pursued too far will produce uh, an atrophy, a undermining of the very benefits. Because clearly, if it can create useful additional investment, it can also produce too much investment, and it can produce misallocation of investment, and it can produce a macroeconomic imbalance. It can produce an economy so focused on investment that the balance between investment and consumption is unreasonable, and at that point, you get the irony that the only way you can keep the economy going is by providing yet more credit, but that builds up debt as a percentage of GDP, and that creates financial risks in the system, such as those which crystallized in Japan at the end of the 1990, 1980s. Now, these processes, I want first of all to stress, are not... Uh, the, these dangers of misallocation of investment are, are not specific to developing e economies. If we were to look at what has happened in Spain or Ireland uh, over uh, the last uh, 15 years in the run-up to the crisis uh, and then after the crisis, uh, we find very uh, rapid uh, rates of growth fueled by credit extension, 
but we find very significant uh, overinvestment. This is a famous uh, airport uh, built by a provincial government in Spain, which managed to persuade uh, the uh, uh, local savings bank to lend it money for an airport for which there is almost no economic value and use whatsoever. And indeed, if you wander around the Irish countryside now, you will find developments of hotels and industrial parks and housing developments, some of which may be eventually simply be, uh, you know, bulldozed and returned to agricultural land. So the process of misallocation of resources through uh, the credit system uh, is one which we can see in developed economies uh, as well as developing. What can we do about it? Hayek himself actually thought we could do very little about it. Uh, he basically said that as so long as we use, make use of bank credit as a means of fostering economic development, we shall have to put up with the resulting cycles. He said there was nothing we could do about it. But I don't think that that is adequate, because I think that the more you go on with the development uh, process, and the more complex one financial system becomes, the danger of the way that the credit cycle can produce harm just becomes so big to the economy that we cannot have uh, that sort of uh, attitude of Hayek that it's just an inevitable byproduct of a rapid uh, development process. So with that as a theoretical background, what can we say about the Chinese economy? Well, one of the things that the Chinese economy has done quite dramatically since 2009 is had an expansion of credit. This is the figure which the People's Bank put out of what is called total social finance. It's essentially uh, aggregate cross-economy leverage. And after 2008-9, that increased dramatically from about 120 to 200% of GDP. And it increased because the government and the People's Bank and the regulators, in response to the danger of an economic slowdown after the global financial crisis, decided to stimulate the economy through investment funded by credit. And the message which went out to the state-owned and other banks was open the wallets wide, and the message which went out to the state-owned enterprises and to the local governments borrowing money in the local government uh, uh, financing vehicles was invest. And so not surprisingly, we had an expansion of credit, oh, and we're there already, uh, it's wonderful the way these slides uh, anticipate us, uh, we had a very significant increase uh, in investment as a percent of GDP as well. Now, that has played a useful role in keeping the Chinese economy going over the last four years, but it creates very real risks. It creates risks that we are now getting a serious misallocation of uh, credit towards not the most productive and useful ends in the Chinese economy. We have a skew of that credit towards state-owned enterprises, not private banks. We have a skew towards local governments who are not subject to any form of what is called hard budget discipline and who can, if they want, sometimes usefully use this investment capacity but sometimes uh, waste it. And we probably have an inefficient politicization of the allocation. I think there are now two fundamental problems. There are two different ways of thinking about the same problem, but it's useful to distinguish them. Two fundamental issues uh, for Chinese economic policy. One is how to achieve, if we think about that chart there, a move away from this very, very heavy focus on investment. Now, if you look at Korea and Japan in their development process, they went through periods of time where they were investing 40% of GDP, but they didn't go through a period of time when they were investing 50% of GDP. This is a historically unique level of investment and it creates some problems of imbalance over time. So the first question is, the leadership has been talking for years about rebalancing this economy from investment to a more normal balance with consumption. How do we achieve that? 
And the question on the financial side, which is simply the same question viewed from a different direction, is are there risks in this very big build-up of debt? Is this heading towards some sort of crisis? Now, there are some people say no, because there are specific Chinese characteristics. In particular, a lot of this debt is owed from state-owned enterprises to state-owned banks or from local government to state-owned banks. So it would be possible to imagine a set of accounting entries in which that debt simply all ended up as national government debt, but was written off at each level of the chain. And I think there is an element of truth of that, and that is what uh, the IMF meant in its Article 4 report in the Chinese on the Chinese economy when it talked about one of the reasons to believe that this may not head to crisis is that the Chinese national state still has strong fiscal resources. But the longer this goes on, I think the greater the danger that we get to the point where that is no longer true and where this debt is held in a set of complicated links into the private sector and into uh, the international economy and therefore where we cannot think of it simply being written off. It creates over time the financial stability risks which crystallized in uh, the developed world in the crisis of 2008. So what should China do uh, faced with those two problems? I guess my overall answer is there are no easy answers. And I think if anybody turns up in China and says, I've got the answer, uh, this is it, uh, they are oversimplifying uh, the case. But let me give a few thoughts of some of the pros and cons. People debate how important is interest rate liberalization, removing the cap on the deposit interest rates. Well, a higher interest rate charged by the banks would probably place some extra uh, discipline on the use of credit and the misallocation of credit, whether it be by some of the state-owned enterprises or by the local governments. But you also have to realize that given that there is a large accumulated amount of debt out there already, significant amounts of an increase in interest rate uh, could, will produce a significant increase in debt servicing burdens and may therefore indeed precipitate a elements of crisis or harmful uh, and sudden uh, responses. All of which says there are no easy answers there. I'm pretty sure, as most economists, that the medium-term path ought to be towards a more liberalized interest rate system. Uh, but there are reasons for thinking through very carefully uh, the sequence uh, and the, uh, the process. And the other thing to say is that it's very easy in this environment to assume that if there have been problems and one of those problems has to do with the nature of the financial system, that financial liberalization is a crucial element of the answer. It may be, actually, that in achieving a rebalance from investment to consumption, financial liberalization is part of the story, but a relatively unimportant part of the story, and that far more important is some issues like the extraordinary subsidies in the Chinese economic system towards heavy investment, such as the land valuation and the land ownership system, which essentially provides very cheap land for categories of infrastructure and industrial development. So my message there is be cautious, think it through. These are very difficult balances to get right. And the simple message of liberalization is the magic answer is almost certainly not true. The other thing that I want to say about the liberalization of the financial markets is that one thing that people suggest, and you can see why it might be useful, is that it would be more useful, it would be useful if there were other categories of credit in the Chinese system rather than just investment credit. And although the textbooks of uh, economics tend to assume they tend to say a bank takes money from households and lends it uh, to business. And they tend to assume that it does that for investment purposes. Actually, in developed financial systems, such as the advanced economies, 
Credit performs many different and quite significantly importantly different uh, functions. Yes, it is sometimes extended to finance real investment projects, but sometimes it is extended to finance speculation or investors in existing assets. Sometimes it is extended to households, and sometimes that is to support the construction of new houses, which is form of, a form of investment, but often it is extended simply to finance the purchase of existing assets. If, for instance, you were to look at the UK, you would see a dramatic increase in household debt over the last 50 years from 15% of GDP in uh, 1964 to 95% just before the crisis, but with almost all of that debt not really linked to any real physical investment process in the economy, but to the purchase of existing houses. And that is true in real estate as well. So, a wider role for credit could be useful in helping to expand, for instance, consumption uh, in China and getting that better balance. Household debt in China is now about 20% of GDP. Logically, that might well develop. But again, we need caution, because we need to realize that when credit is extended not to finance investment, but also is available to finance existing assets, then we have a new and different and even more powerful form of potential instability. It is possible when credit is extended to purchase existing assets, whether it be financial assets or commercial real estate or existing houses, that we get these very, very powerful cycles in which more credit extended simply drives asset price increases, which then convinces both borrowers and lenders that it's a very good idea to lend and borrow even more money, and the cycle goes up of a self-reinforcing cycle of credit and asset prices. That is what we saw in uh, the UK in the, uh, 90, in the period before the crisis. It is a cycle essentially associated with the thinking of Hyman Minsky. And I think it's very important, therefore, to realize that in terms of the credit problems that can come, from out-of-control credit creation, they can be the sort of crisis problem created, uh, described by Friedrich Hayek, which is overinvestment in actual physical real assets, but it can also be the sort of cycles described by Hyman Minsky, which is simply a set of speculative cycles in existing assets, and both can be harmful. Now, in relation then to those other aspects of credit, credit to finance, speculation, maybe in existing real estate, what is going on in China? Well, I think the point about China is we don't fully know what is going on in that respect. We certainly know that China is seeing the development of what people call a shadow banking system, a growth of uh, these things called trust loans, entrusted loans, wealth management products. Some of those are probably going to finance real physical uh, investment. But some of them, I think, are also probably going to invest simply investment in asset plays, uh, the purchase of existing uh, assets, uh, in particular real estate assets, in a way that produces uh, spirals. And again, this, I think, is something that China has to look very carefully at uh, looking for forward. Yes, there are arguments for a different balance of consumer credit versus investment credit going forward. Yes, I would find it extraordinary if it was not the case that mortgage debt as a percent of GDP in China would tend uh, to increase over time. But do not imagine that that is without its risks. It has very major risks attached to it, that this can drive speculative uh, booms and harm. And, as Bill Janeway said, the crucial insight from economic history is that when booms and busts 
are focused simply in liquid equity markets, the bust can occur without a catastrophic effect on the ongoing economy. It is when we have these booms and busts of credit uh, that we have harmful effects. Let me then finally end with this side, which tries to sum up the implications, really, of the theory, but I think there are implications uh, which somewhat apply to China. First, credit cycles matter. And they have a very big impact on both the real investment balance, on the stability of the financial system, and when they turn down, we tend to have deleveraging effects which are highly depressive. Credit allocation matters. It matters to whom the banking system is extending credit. Free markets alone will ensure neither a micro-efficient allocation between broad categories, and that is because the interest rate elasticity of demand for different categories of credit can vary a lot. Basically, a, if you try, if a real estate boom is going on, the people involved in that real estate boom are not very sensitive to what you do to the interest rate. Um, and free markets alone will not achieve macro stability. Achieving price stability alone via an interest rate management is insufficient, and defining financial stability solely in terms of your banks not going bankrupt is also insufficient. You can create instability through the credit creation process even if the banks stay solvent. What then are the positive implications? We need to have an integrated management and constraint of the credit cycle, which involves a combination of monetary policy tools, the interest rate, of macroprudential tools, such as the use of countercyclical capital, and I would argue direct constraints on some specific categories of borrowers. And secondly, you need a strategic view on the implications of credit allocation as between investment, consumer credit, real estate uh, development, uh, existing assets, the balance between whether people are borrowing credit to buy existing assets uh, or investment, but do not think there are any perfect answers, and the balance between investment and consumption. But again, I'm not aware of any perfect answers there. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.